hi everyone welcome back to this corner of inspiration if it's your first time joining us i make videos based on experiences life lessons challenges and adventures as a godly woman as promised in my last video this is part two of the video what to look for in a life partner for a godly woman diving even deeper into the qualities of a godly man and what questions to ask from a potential life partner. Before I go ahead, if you haven't watched part one of this video, please go ahead and watch it before you watch this one. I won't go over all the questions from part one again to save time, but I would like to reiterate as I have in my previous videos that you should make sure you are ready before getting married. You don't want to enter a marriage unprepared and end up miserable for the rest of your life, sisters. If you are not in a position where you are content on your own, please think about spending some time to prayerfully get your emotional state correct before starting a search. I suggest you view the video positioning yourself as a godly woman to attract a godly man in which I offer guidance on preparing yourself for marriage on a spiritual, emotional, and practical level. Please note that a man shouldn't be the sole thing bringing you happiness. He should rather be an addition to your life. Amen. Having Jesus in your life ought to bring you happiness, contentment, and fulfillment on its own. So, when you have met a potential spouse or life partner, you ought to figure out his life goals. Does he wish to have children? Does he intend to work in ministry? Does he desire a part-time or a full-time career in ministry? Does he wish to go for missions trips? Does he wish to grow in ministry alongside a partner or a wife? These are difficult but important questions to ask or think about while attempting to determine what qualities to look for in a life partner. Be patient, sisters. This potential partner could be the head of your household and even the father of your future children. You might want to reconsider everything if that doesn't seem like something you can wait on. Marriage can happen quickly, and I hope it does. However, if it doesn't, please persevere. If you have complete faith in God, you won't be let down. He will continue to work in your favor behind the scenes so that everything works out for good for you. God hears our prayers but sometimes he doesn't always do so on our schedules. So after you've asked your potential partner those questions in part one of this video and determined that he is indeed a true godly man and is serious about the relationship and about getting married to you, then I would suggest that you ask the appropriate questions. So go ahead and ask the following questions. Number one, ask him, what are you looking for in a life partner? Men have different expectations from women when it comes to marriage. So I can't stress this point enough. Your potential godly man might be searching for a stay-at-home spouse who could take care of the kids, cook and clean while he takes care of the bills. Or he might be seeking for someone with her own business perhaps or someone with a high level of education and who would split the bills 50-50 or maybe someone without any college degree, and so on. Thus, it's imperative to start asking these questions as early as possible in the relationship. Which brings up the following question about the finances. So, regardless of what you have agreed upon about the bills, I suggest that you do some research to determine whether his income or both incomes will support your family over the long term. Think about matters like if it would be important for your family as well as where you would reside. Speak openly and agree to share each other's credit scores. You must find common ground on this issue because God forbid it is one of the main causes of divorce. Now in my opinion, the husband should take the lead at home 
which includes handling the finances. But according to Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, the woman could also help the husband because it states, it is not good for a man to be alone. I will make him a helper that is fit for him. Proverbs 31 also discusses the virtues of a noble woman. It states that she is far more valuable than rubies. Her husband has complete faith in her and lacks nothing of value. She makes and sells linen garments. Thus, I think that regardless of how well our husbands are paid, women may also contribute or at least ensure that in the event of shortage or drought, we are prepared, just like the virtuous woman. Verse 21 states that, She has no fear when it snows, because everyone in her household is dressed. It states that she watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her husband is proud of her. He believes in her and he lacks nothing of value. Additionally, it states that her husband is well known at the city gate where he sits among the local elders of the city. Glory be to God. Now, given the fact that conflict will inevitably arise in any relationship and you might be wondering how you would resolve it when it does. So ask him, what is your conflict resolution style? Though some people might not be aware of this, everyone has a particular conflict resolution style, or at least a combination of a couple of them. Here are a few examples. Number one, the compromising conflict resolution style. If you disagree how to divide, for example, chores like doing the dishes, you could use this style and compromise by doing them in turns or equally. The next example is active listening. It's when you get ready to listen intently, paying attention to the verbal and non-verbal cues that are being given, considering what's being said, and then responding appropriately to demonstrate that you're paying attention to what's being said and remembering the information for later. This style is actually my favorite since it shows that you both understand one another. By deliberately engaging to clear any misunderstandings and developing clear communication of the thoughts and ideas between the two of you, the speaker receives validation that his or her argument is being understood and that the listener absorbs additional information and understanding. When using this style, involving a third party, a mentor or a family member because you are unable to resolve a problem may be avoided. This creates a bond and a mutual understanding between you. Another example of a conflict resolution style is the mediation style. This one requires that you use a mediator or an impartial third party to help you reach a mutually agreeable solution in a conflict. It enables you to exchange your views, identify crucial problems and explore conflict resolution strategies. Communicating about your conflict resolution styles will enable you to determine whether you two can accept and value one another's viewpoints as well as whether you need to make some compromises to make room for one another if your styles differ. This brings me to the next question to ask your potential partner, which is about love languages. There are five love languages which relate to how individuals prefer to show and receive love from each other. They are as follows. Words of affirmation, quality time, physical touch, acts of service, and receiving gifts. Everyone has a primary love language. Even though we could have all these languages inside us, Knowing each other's primary love language is crucial since it makes you feel valued and loved. For instance, after an argument, one of you could give the other a present or make their favorite meal. 
The next question to ask your potential partner is if he has a spiritual father, mentor, or someone else with whom he discusses significant matters and who holds him responsible. This individual may also be a family member to whom he has obligations. Each of you actually needs another person who will hold you accountable. Because, let's face it, there can be times when you disagree so strongly that a third party has to mediate the dispute. The Bible says, Without counsel, plans fail, but with many advisors, they succeed. At this point, you can tell if he is serious about marriage by asking him to involve his parents and family. So I would suggest that you ask him politely. Which brings up the next question. How do you feel about your relationship with your parents, siblings or immediate family members? One reason you are asking this question is to try to figure out how he interacts with his immediate family members. And if it happens that you meet them and see how he interacts with them, and if it happens that he doesn't respect them, he probably won't respect you either. Ask him this next question. What are your thoughts on family traditions and customs? Naturally, you would have talked to each other already about your traditions and tried to figure out whether you both agree with them and work out any differences. For instance... My husband and I do not believe in all the traditions and customs from either sides of our families, but we do agree on some because they are morally righteous, such as the paying of the bride price. Next, ask if there are any illnesses you should be aware of. I know this is a sensitive subject, but you have to be as transparent as you can because we are talking about marriage here, sisters. Yes, the Bible states that we are healed by the stripes of Jesus, but we need to bring everything to the open. I advise that you show each other your medical records. Reach an understanding on any matters pertaining to your health and engage in prayer. Matthew chapter 18 verse 19 states that if we ask anything from the Father in the name of Jesus, it will be granted to us if we agree upon it. Asking each other this crucial following question will help you both. Do you have children of your own or stepchildren? If there are any kids already, discuss matters like their ages and the extent of parental concerns with each other. Decide if and how many children you would like to have in the future. God forbid, but what if both of you are wanting children but having trouble conceiving? Once more, the Bible affirms that God can grant your request for children. Just as he has made it possible for you to meet, he can grant you children too. Adoption is another option to consider if both of you agree to it. The next question to ask is, what do you do in your free time or for fun? You can find out if you have comparable interests in hobbies or activities by asking this question. Alternatively, you can both make sacrifices and learn each other's hobbies and allow one another to enjoy yourselves and develop a closer relationship. Having said the above though, I would want to advise you concerning a potential partner that may still be a recent convert. You need to be cautious when judging them because a recent convert may still be experiencing difficulties transitioning to his new faith. Be understanding, patient, and be aware that he might still be developing his faith. Considering marrying a recently converted Christian can be a wise and fulfilling choice. Many times, newly converted Christians are fervently devoted to their faith and ready to develop. This is positive because they are in a critical phase of growing their relationship with God. It may also help you both seize the chance to build a close bond as you support one another's faith and develop as a couple spiritually. However, look for characteristics like humility, integrity, and a sincere desire to do God's will. And these are essential for a godly spouse and can be found in a newly converted Christian who is devoted to his faith. Make sure he has mentors or a solid support system. 
This is essential to his development of accountability and faith. Make sure you have similar interests, goals, and values, just like in any relationship. It's best to base your decision to evaluate a new Christian for marriage on his character, his level of commitment, faith, and how well your goals and principles align. You can make an informed and prudent decision if you pray and give it some serious thought. Finally, in case your potential life partner is a foreign national, consider the following. Godly men are found all over the world, but if your potential partner is not a citizen of the country you call home, you might want to look at part one of this video. I also suggest asking yourself the following questions. Does he intend to live with you or separately from you? If he wants to live apart from you, be cautious and don't get married unless you are positive that his intentions are right. Is he demanding to reside in the country you belong to? Re-evaluate his intentions to desire to marry you unless his response seems sincere. If you are not sure about the motives of a foreign partner, you may want to think about getting an expert to help you as well. Ultimately, pray and ask God for guidance. Seek his wisdom and discernment to determine whether any potential partner is the proper match for you in the light of his word found in James chapter 1 verse 5. It says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. So there you have it, sisters and brothers. I hope this was helpful. Let us pray. Father, this is the part two of this video. What to look for in a life partner for a godly woman. We have prayed and we believe that you shall continue to enlighten your children. Enlighten your daughters, O oh God, in Jesus' name and guide them. We thank you, Father. Amen. Thank you for watching. I hope this information was of help to you all. If you have any questions or video suggestions, please comment below in the description box. And I'll see you in the next one.